Okay, so welcome to Hottest. Uh, we're delighted today to have Jamie Vickery from the University of Cambridge, who will be giving us a talk about a type theory for strictly unital infinity categories. Go ahead, Jamie. Thanks. Thanks, Dan and Chris, and hi, everybody. I'm really ashamed to say this is my first hottest seminar that I've ever participated in, a very embarrassing state of affairs, which I will make sure to uh, make sure it won't be my last, put it that way. So I'm delighted to tell you about this work that I've been doing uh, over the last year or so with, um, uh, oh my goodness, that's the wrong archive link. You, you, you can polish slides for days and miss the, the most obvious thing on the, on the front page. A paper from this year, not last year, I goodness knows what that's a link to, uh, on a type theory for strictly unital infinity categories. So this is work with, uh, with Eric Finster, who everyone here knows, and David Reuter, who was a student of mine and now works at the University of Bonn. Uh, maybe those people people uh, uh, are here. Uh, oh, Eric, Eric's here. That's great. I don't know if David will be, will be joining us at some point. Um, okay, so this is not a talk about homotopy type theory per se. I wouldn't call myself a homotopy type theorist, but it is about using type theory to work with infinity categories. So you've got to say it's at least in the ballpark. And uh, at the end of the talk, I'm definitely going to see if uh, there's some way to, to build bridges between what we're doing here and what people do in homotopy type theory. Okay, so let's start with some motivation. So suppose we're in some higher structure, like a two groupoid. I, I want to, uh, to be, I'll be talking model independently here, really. It doesn't really matter what uh, particular model of higher groupoid you're using or higher structure you're using. So suppose I've got points X and Y, <clears throat> one cells F, G, H, and J with those specified types. And then suppose I've got three cells, mu, nu, and zeta in this pattern. So mu goes from F to the identity on X, nu goes from G to H, zeta goes from H to J. Then if you look at the, the types that those guys have, mu, nu, and zeta, you might think, well, we could compose them like this maybe. Uh, mu and nu could be composed horizontally and then zeta could plug into this h here. So we could write this simple expression, mu zero composed with nu, that means horizontally, and one composed with zeta, means vertically. So that would be maybe sort of morally a, a fine way to compose mu, nu, and zeta. Trouble is, it's not valid, right? Because the source of zeta is not the identity composed with h, right? The source of zeta is just h, okay? So we might, think for a moment intuitively, this is what we want to do, but we wouldn't expect that our uh, proof assistant, for example, uh, would, uh, would, would accept this. So what we'd have to do instead would be something like this. We'd have to say, well, we can compose mu and nu horizontally. And then we've got to insert a coherence cell to account for the fact that the identity composed with H is not identical to H, it's merely isomorphic to H or equal to H, right? There's different ways we would say that uh, in different, slightly different domains of mathematics. And after we've pushed in that, uh, that, that coherence, that coercion, if you will, we can then go on and compose with zeta. So that's correct. And we can, of course, type that, but it's obviously more verbose, okay? So there's a trade-off here. Uh, between simplicity on the one side and correctness on the other side. Presumably we would, we would choose correctness most of the time, right? If we want to uh, use computers to do, uh, help us with our, our high category theory. But then the idea is the following. Isn't this unit structure somehow trivial? Isn't it in some sense obvious that uh, what is the nature of the coherence that needs to be inserted here? Why isn't my type system, my, my proof assistant, able to handle this composite uh, labeled here I? So there's a few things we might like. First of all, we might want the type checker to just accept I, maybe because the type checker does some checking under the hood and it checks that in principle, even though I is not valid, uh, in principle, it could insert the necessary coercions to make it valid, so just, so just accept I. Another thing we might want would be for the type checker to take I, a simple composition, which isn't technically valid in the type theory, uh, and inflate it into two, inserting those missing coherences. Maybe it even could do that silently and then just check that the inflated thing is type correct and then not even show it to us. 
A third thing we might want to do uh, is take this, this composite two and deflate it as it were back to one to produce something that's a simpler representation that's just as good as the representation, representation we started with. So that's the project that we've been working on, basically trying to understand how we can type theoretically trivialize the unit structure of paths uh, in, in a type theory. And so we've achieved this, this, this first part and we've achieved this last part. So that's things we'll talk about. This part in the middle, I, I would have loved for this to be ready in time for this talk. We haven't quite achieved that yet, but I can firmly say that's work in, that's work in progress. So that motivates what we're trying to do. So in this talk, uh, this is how it's gonna go. First of all, I'm going to recall CAT, which is this beautiful, uh, simple type theory for weak infinity categories, which Eric Finster and Samuel Mimram introduced a few years ago. I'm going to give a reduction relation on terms of this type theory, which in some clear sense removes the unit structure. And then I'm gonna show this is a, uh, this, this is a useful type theory. Uh, this is a useful reduction relation. It's confluent and terminating. It's got nice properties. And then we use this to define a new type theory, CAT strictly unital, by taking CAT, Finster Miram's original type theory, and then saying, we're gonna change this theory. Uh, we're gonna add a notion of definitional equality that says we only care about terms up to this reduction relation. We're then going to observe that models of CAT SU are strictly unital infinity categories. That's a nice thing to have, such a definition. And then we're going to investigate some non-trivial examples, see some nice rich terms we can build in these type theories and speculate on possible future application of these ideas to Martin Loeff identity types. I really want to encourage you to ask questions and things like that so I don't feel like I'm madman talking by myself in a, in a room. Okay, so first of all, overview of CAT. So this is a beautiful uh, type theory, as I said, which Samuel Memram and Eric Finster came up with a few years ago. I've been thinking about it overwhelmingly for the, for the past year, uh, and I think it's not as well known as it should be. So I'm just gonna give an overview of CAT. So it's a type theory. So what have we got? We've got contexts, gamma, delta, capital Greek letters. These are lists of variables with types. So the thing you would expect, if a context is valid, we'll write something like this. And we are going to interpret this, some valid context, gamma, as the generating data for a free infinity category, uh, gamma tilde, right? So it's like the, the infinity category you would have if the only cells that you knew you had for sure were these cells with these types, and then of course all composites of them that are valid in a free infinity category. Types, capital Roman letters are trivial. So the trivial type uh, just means the category itself, I guess or pairs of parallel terms. So for any two terms, U and V that are parallel, we can form the Holm space and that's another type. If the type is valid, we'll write this very obvious thing. And the interpretation, if we see this, this means in the free infinity category generated by gamma, there's a Holm set A. So star is a useful type because that's like the Holm set of objects, if you will, objects of an infinity category don't live in a home set, so we let star be the home set for objects. That's kind of convenient. Terms in this theory are either variables or coherences. Uh, variables are just these guys that appear that arise from the context. Coherences are composites that we build. If a term is valid, then we write this in the usual type theoretic way, and we interpret that as meaning in the free infinity, infinity category generated by gamma, there's a morphism T in the home set A. So the point is that. Uh, Typing judgments in this type theory correspond absolutely immediately to uh, elementary statements about the infinity category, right? Makes it a very nice type theory to work with. Everything here is directed, by the way. These are free infinity infinity categories, I should say. And then finally, we have substitution. So a substitution from gamma to delta is a function sigma from the variables of gamma to the terms of delta. And given such a function, we can then compute from that uh, a, a richer function from the terms of gamma to the terms of delta. So it's something that can take anything living in the free infinity category gamma, give me something living in the free infinity category delta. And so of course we interpret that as follows. There's a strict infinity functor sigma from the free infinity category on gamma to the free infinity category on delta. So I'm not gonna spend, I could of course spend the whole hour talking about cat, it's a beautiful theory, 
will mostly, as far as we use cat, be resting on these intuitions that cat does uh, what it claims to be doing. Now, an interesting feature about cat is that it has no definitional equality. T uh, terms have unique types, right? So if T has type A and T has type B, then A is identical to B. So it makes it quite simple type theory in some sense, but somehow computationally empty. Of course, it's not a trivial theory. It describes something perfectly interesting. That's an interesting feature of the theory, which will be relevant for us later. Now, an important feature of how CAT works is the way that we can characterize pasting contexts. And we're going to illustrate these with these guys, these gadgets called Batanin trees, uh, which many people here, I'm, I'm certain, will be great experts on. So let's illustrate this. So we're going to start with a Batanin tree containing just a single node X. And that corresponds to the context where we just have X and it's an object. Now, what we can do is we can take this Batanin tree and repeatedly add a new leaf to it. And as we do so, we're adding elements to our pasting diagram, and we're also building up our context in a certain way. So we add a leaf F, that, that means we now, by the, the, the combinatorics of these trees, mean we need a new little variable name here. And now we've added a one-dimensional cell to our pasting diagram. We can go on and add a, another leaf higher up, height two. Now we've got a two morphism mu. We can add another leaf here, new, that's a two cell, and another leaf here, j, that's uh, a one cell. And as we've been doing that, as you'll see, we've built up this context. So not all contexts in CAT arise in this way, but the ones that do, the ones that arise in this nice way from botanic trees, um, they're called pasting contexts, and they play a very important role in the theory, as we'll see. These leaf variables, so in this case, mu, new, and j, uh, they're not necessarily maximal, maximal dimensional. J, for example, is only a, a one-dimensional variable. Uh, there exist two-dimensional variables in this context, so it's not maximal. But we say it's locally maximal, right? It's not the boundary of some higher dimensional cell. So this notion of locally maximal uh, generator is going to be very important for us as well. Something else that we can do inductively in this type theory, recursively, I should say, is describe the boundaries of these pasting contexts. So given a combinatorial description of this pasting diagram, we can extract from it its target pasting diagram. That's H followed by J, and also its source pasting diagram, that's F followed by J. And we see those here. So CAT gives us the infrastructure, uh, as uh, Eric and Samuel have taught us, to compute all these things nicely uh, about pasting contexts. Now, how do we construct non-trivial terms in CAT, right? This is the... This is the main trick. And there's really just one uh, beautiful, simple idea here, which of course is inspired by ideas that go back decades in the foundations of uh, category theory. So, so the, 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 uh, one of the main non-trivial uh, term formation rules is as follows. Suppose we've got some pasting context gamma. And suppose we look in the source of gamma and we've got some time U that lives there of type A. And suppose we look at the target of gamma, and we've got some term V there of type A, then we get a filler. So we get a term that we call the composite, and it has type U to V. So let's illustrate that. We've got a context gamma. We look at its source. We find a term living in that source. It's got a target. We find a term living in that target. And then the, the, the constructor gives us back a term uh, comp gamma UV living over the whole context gamma. And there's a side condition, which is that in order to use this, this filler rule to produce these composites, then U and V have to use every variable of their context. So U needs to uh, involve X, H, uh, Y, J, and Z, for example, in this, uh, for this example. If the term U was just chosen to be the variable J, that wouldn't be a full term. It wouldn't make reference to the variable H. So the slogan, in lots of these slides, I put the slogan at the top, which might be easier to follow than the technical content of the slide. In a pasting context, parallel full terms can be filled. That's the idea. So this gives us what we call composites in the theory. It's another similar rule. I think this is a beautiful and conceptually profound idea, by the way. It's not at all obvious that this should be how we can compose things in higher category theory. Um, I, for one, think we don't spend enough time 
well, we certainly don't at the moment. This is what coffee breaks are for at, at conferences, right? Or in the bar in the evening, thinking, why do we, why do, we do things in this way? Uh, if you ask me, it relates to lots of interesting ideas. Uh, I, I, my, my background is in quantum gravity, say for stands. Sounds to me like, like quantum holography, right? If you, if, if you know what's going on in the boundary, then you know what's going on in the interior. Anyway, I, every time I think deeply about this, uh, I'm, I'm, str I'm struck by how astoundingly beautiful it is, I think, as an idea, which I'm still uh, trying to come to terms with, I think, in some sense. Okay, so this is how we build composites. How do we, we can also build something we call coherences. So let's see how these work. It's very similar. Suppose you've got a pasting context gamma, and we've got some term u of type A, gamma. And suppose also over gamma, we have some term V of type A. So we're not, the difference here is that we're now look at looking at the boundary of gamma. The boundary of gamma is irrelevant. We've just got two terms that live over gamma. Then we get a new term that lives over gamma. And we can think of this as a coherence law that says U is equivalent to V in the context gamma. That's the idea. So now we can give a bunch of examples. Um, so if we want the binary composite of one morphisms F and G, we can do it like this. We work in this simple context given by two one cells, that's a pasting context. Uh, and the source term, we choose X, that lives over the source. The target term, we choose Z, that lives over the target. This represents the binary composite F circle G, which we'll just write like this. We can also do something uh, called a unary composite. If we take the pasting context just of a single uh, one cell, then we say, well, we could choose X for a term living in its source, Y for a term living in its target. And this gives a term which is not the term F itself. It's the unary composite of F. Okay, that's interesting. That's something in a theory of weak infinity categories we might accept uh, is going to be living, uh, is going to be hanging around. What else can we do? We can build an identity one cell. So in the, mo in the most trivial pasting context here, consisting just of a single point, we can certainly choose the term X itself as the U and the V for the coherence. And then we get a law that says X equals X. Well, of course it does. We can define this to be our identity one cell. Now to obtain richer terms, we can substitute these composites and coherences, which we build inside pasting, pasting context into any other context that we like. For example, if we've got composable one cells P and Q in any context, doesn't have to be a pasting context, we can compose them by taking this guy and substituting. So the P substitutes for the F and the Q substitutes for the G, that's the notation. We can build a unitor of one morphism F. We build this using the coherence constructor because this is like a law saying that the identity composed with F is isomorphic to F. So that's a, a two cell, uh, which we could call lambda F, a unitor. And we could build an associator, another familiar gadget from the world of weak high category theory. If we're in this context uh, with three one cells glued together like this, this is again a pasting context. And if we compose F with G and then with H or F with G then H, um, we can apply our coherence constructor and this gives us something we can call the associator. Okay, so very easily the point here is we can build all sorts of terms that we should be very familiar, familiar with from the theory of bicategories higher dimensional categories. And so something to drive home here is that every cat term, because I've, I've, I've been very quick in the way I describe the syntax of cat, every term is either a variable or a composite term or a coherence term. There's no other things that exist in cat. So that's like saying in our free infinity category on some signature, every cell in that free infinity category is either a generator or a composite of cells or a coherence law applied to some cells. Okay, so that seems reasonable. So now let's uh, talk about some more of the, the beautiful combinatorics that, that, that underlie um, this type theory cat. So we can build a category out of this type theory as follows. Uh, I'm gonna build this category cat sub PS, which has pasting contexts as objects and substitutions as morphisms. Substitutions compose, I haven't explained how that works, but that's just uh, works in, it's not very exotic how that works in this type theory. So we can build a category out of this uh, type theory in, in a natural way. Then we can make the following nice observation. Any pasting context, 
is a co-limit of the locally maximal disks. So remember from the Batanin tree perspective, the locally maximal cells were the leaves of the tree. So what we're saying here is you have a Batanin tree and you want to form the pasting context, you can build that the associated pasting context as a co-limit of disks where there's one disk for each leaf in your Batanin tree. It's a very nice picture geometrically. So this is a little co-limit diagram we've got down here. And if you take the co-limit in the category cat PS, you get this nice pasting context. And we call such a co-limit a globular sum because we're, we're, we're gluing together these disks. And then we have a very simple, elegant definition. An infinity category is a pre-sheaf on cat BFs, which preserves globular sums. So takes them into uh, limits in the category of sets. Now this is known to agree. We've got lots of nice results now, um, thanks to recent work of Dimitri Ara, John Bork and Thibaut Benjamin, who's just successfully defended his thesis on related topics. Congratulations again, Thibaut. Um, this is known to be uh, to agree with the definition of contractible infinity category, which is of course very well known in the higher category theory um, community, going back of course to Grothendieck, Maltziniotis, Batanin, and Leinster. All of these people described this notion of contractible infinity category in a very different way. So those four people had four different descriptions. Cat, I, was argue, I would argue, was a fifth description, which is again very different. Um, I would argue that Cat is the most elementary of all of those definitions. Certainly, it's the, the only one that can be easily told to a computer, right? Which for everybody here is an advantage. Of course, not all mathematicians will agree on how important that is. What's certainly the case is we don't need the technology of globular extensions, which is what the Maltziniotis development is based on. And we don't need the technology of globular operads. So if you read, for example, Tom Lines's fantastic book, High Categories, Higher Operads, you won't get to the definition of contractible infinity categories until you're at least two inches into the book, okay? Because you have to set up a lot of machinery. Um, the beauty of how this type theory cat works is it lets you work with an equivalent theory, but from my perspective, from much more elementary um, foundations, right? In, in, in the best possible sense. Okay. So that's the, that's the type theory cap. So now I want to start telling you about strict units. How are we going to take this type theory for infinity categories and uh, start to work with the unit structure? So there's a few ideas that, that we use. I'm gonna show you those over a couple of slides. So this is the most important idea. We call it P reduction and P stands for pruning. The idea here is if we've got a composite or a coherence where one of the arguments we're feeding into that composite appearance is itself an identity, then we just clip it out. We just throw that argument away and we discard the corresponding part of the pasting context that was controlling the composite. So let's see how that works. Suppose we've got some pasting context gamma and some variable mu, which is locally maximal, such that if we take mu living in gamma and we substitute it with sigma, we're gonna get some term in delta. Suppose that's an identity term. In that case, we can notice that this substitution sigma is guaranteed to factorize as follows. First of all, by a substitution pi sub mu, and all that the substitution pi sub mu does is it sends this variable mu of gamma to an identity. So it collapses geometrically that part of the pasting diagram gamma. So it sends mu to an identity term on every other variable of gamma sends it to a variable. So pi mu somehow doesn't do anything interesting at all, except it collapses this cell mu. And then sigma slash mu, what does that do? Well, it does everything else that sigma did, because sigma is just some arbitrary substitution just with the property that it sends mu to an identity. So we can factorize it as follows. So here's a little example. Suppose gamma looks like this. And suppose sigma trivializes mu, sends mu to an identity then we can build this auxiliary context gamma slash mu, where we just take this two cell mu and we just rip it out. So you see down here, it's gone. And pi mu uh, takes all the variables here to the same variable living down here. 
except of course mu is collapsed to the identity on G and F is also collapsed to G. So that's a very geometrically natural idea uh, if I do say so myself. And the intuition is that mu has been collapsed or pruned from the perspective of the Batanin tree. Mu is a leaf and we're pruning that leaf away, right? Just like deadheading your roses. So then we define the reduction as follows. If we compose in a context gamma, uh, boundary terms U and V with respect to sigma, then what we do is we say, well, sigma is pi mu compose sigma slash mu. This is a, a factorization system of sorts. And we say, instead of this being a composite over gamma, we want this to be a composite over gamma slash mu, where this whole cell mu has been completely removed from the story. Now, so this is our reduction relation on terms and it works exactly the same way for composites as for coherences. Okay, now that's the heart. This is the heart of the whole talk. This is the heart of our whole idea. I remember when Eric and David and I were sitting in my office in Birmingham and we, we saw how this worked. That was where this whole project came from. It's, it's a very geometrically natural way to manipulate terms in this type theory, but that's not all we need. We need two other uh, types of reduction, which I, which, which I think are very interesting as well. So let me tell you about those. First of all, we're going to recursively define the n-sphere type for any n, and also the n-disc n -disc context for any n as follows. The zero disc is just a point, and the n plus one disc, well, how do you build an n plus one disc? You take an n disc, you glue on um, another n minus one, uh, you, you glue on um, another n disc, the n prime, and then you fill the gap in between them, right? Topologically, that's just the standard way to build disks. So what are these spheres? Well, the minus one sphere is the point in the traditional way, and the n sphere is just a type that says, I can go from the first n disc that sort of lived in here and the second n disc that I glued in here. So that's a nice little mutually recursive series. So now let's build the first few of these. Here's the zero disc context, it's just a point. Here's the one disc context, it's two points and a one cell. Here's the two disc context, it's two points, two discs and a 2D filler and so on. Okay, so in an obvious way for any n, for any n we can build the n-disc context. Then we notice the following. So we've already seen the unary composite of a one cell, something we saw earlier on in the talk. We can use these n-disc contexts to build unary composites of, of n cells u for any dimension u as follows. We work in this n-disc context and we perform a composite Remember the definition of a composite was, if we scroll back quickly, we have to, we have to define a composite, we have to give a context, and then we have to give a set, we have to give a term living over the source of that context and a term living over the target of that context. So let's see how we apply that to disk contexts here. We choose the disk context here. The source of the disk context is the N minus one disk. The target of the disk context um, is the other n minus one disk that we glued in. For example, for the two disk context here, the source is D1, and the target is D1 prime, right? That makes total geometrical sense. And now we can feed in an n cell. So uh, this is uh, a fantastic candidate for the unary composite of U. So it's like U in brackets. Yeah, yes, Dan. So when you're defining dn plus one, um, should the first capital dn maybe be a lowercase d sub n? So no, so it is written correctly. Okay. The notation is maybe a little bit confusing. Yeah. So here dn plus one is a context and we build it up inductively. So here dn is also a context. And now what I'm doing is I'm taking that context dn and I'm adding to it this variable and I'm adding to it this variable. So I'm not really, this isn't really the three element list. Mm. This is supposed to be the concatenation of this context with this guy and this guy. So this okay. is a, a, a way, so I mean the flattening of this list. So this is a way this is often written in the sort of type theory world. It's a bit confusing, I agree. Does that answer the question that you had? 
Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for asking that. So then, uh, what's the reduction relation that we specify? It says, we've got no interest in unary composites. If ever I see the unary composite of U, I just want to simplify that to U itself. So that we call this disk reduction. Okay, so U, the unary composite of U reduces to U itself. And now there's only one other source of reduction in our theory, and we call this L reduction. And the intuition here is that we can eliminate loops in the theory. So let's think about this. Consider a coherence term. Now let's jump back and look at the definition of coherence terms in CAT. We chose a pasting context. We chose any, any full term over that pasting context and any other full term over that pasting context. And we got a, a coherence term, co gamma uv. This is somehow a law that says u is equal to v in the theory. In particular, of course, u and v aren't necessarily the same term, but they could be the same term. And that's exactly what we're concerned with here. Suppose we chose u and v to be the same. Then this is a coherence law that says the term u substituted with sigma is equal to the term u substituted with sigma, right? Um, well, of course it is. This doesn't seem like a particularly useful term. And indeed, we already had a canonical witness for the fact that u of sigma is equal to u of sigma, namely the identity term on u of sigma, which has certainly got the same type as this guy we built above. Sorry, so the point is, uh, Sorry, James, go ahead. Weren't the identity terms exactly defined in this manner as coherences? They, they were, but but what we, could, what we can do is we can look at the, so let's go back and look at the definition of the identity on this term, and we'll compare it to this guy. So let's go back uh, the issue and look like whether at an identity. Or, or That's right. Yeah. That's right. So I've actually only given you, you here an example of an identity one cell, not an example of an identity n cell. The identity one cell is built over this, which is the zero disk context. So we build, uh, if, if we wanted to have the coherence, uh, which is the identity on an n cell, we would do this in the n disk context. So I, I should have written that out here, right? So just as we can do unary composites using n disk context, so also we do, if we want to build the identity on an N cell, we, we build that using the N disk context. I should have given that, thanks for asking. This term here has got absolutely nothing to do with the N disk context. It's not built over the N disk context, it's built over gamma, whatever the hell pasting context gamma is. So you're right that the identity term is built as a coherence. Ah, you, so I could have misunderstood the point you're making. The identity on a term is of that form. That's right. Because the identity, let's scroll back and look here, is a coherence where this guy is equal to this guy, which is exactly a red X for um, L reduction. So thank you for spotting that. What that means is identity terms reduce to themselves. Okay, because what we what we're going to say here is that what we do in L reduction, we've got no need or desire to have this in our theory. We're happy to just have the identity on U of sigma. Now, the trouble with that, as you've, as you've noticed, Emily, is that an identity term is itself of this form. So therefore, identity terms reduce to, reduce to themselves. And this is going to give us failure of termination as, as we try to reduce. So that's something we're going to have to handle. And we talk about that in the next slide. So this is this is the entirety of, of, of these are all the generators of reduction. Pruning, where you throw away an identity argument. Say if I'm going to substitute in an identity for mu, why did I even have mu in my pasting context at all? Let's just get rid of it. Disk reduction, where we say unary composites of a cell are not interesting to me, just replace them with the cell itself. And loops, where we say U is canonically equivalent to U, we can just replace that with the identity on U. We didn't have any need for this as a separate thing. Now, this isn't going to be well behaved as a reduction system, as, as, as Emily has noticed, because identities are themselves um, red X's for this loop law. So how do we get a well-behaved reduction relation? Firstly, we extend 
P reduction, D reduction, and L reduction to subterms, right? We, of course, don't only want to be able to reduce in the head, we want to be able to reduce in arguments as well. And we add a single additional rule. If we've got a term whose head is an identity, it's now fixed. We're never going to think about reducing that anymore because indeed it would reduce to itself and it would call re cause reduction to fail to terminate. So if we ever have a term which is an identity, we can continue to normalize its unique argument further. So for example, if we've got this term, maybe u of sigma fails to be normalized, we could continue to normalize that, but we will never again try to uh, normalize the, the head of the term itself. Now, let's see some examples then of reduction in action. So let's take a one cell composed with an identity. So how did we define that? Well, uh, this was our, our uh, composition law for two one cells, F and G. And um, what are the two one cells we're composing? F and the identity on Y. So this is the definition of F composed the identity on Y. Now we can prune this because you see we're pasting it in here, an identity for G. G is a locally maximal cell, so we can prune that away. So now we throw away this leaf of the battalion tree, and now we're just left with this guy. Uh, this is the unary composite of F, and we throw, uh, we do D reduction and say, I'll just have D, I'll just have F itself, thank you. So let's see, does this sanity check? We've got F composed with an identity, and this normalizes to F. I think that passes the sanity check, right? If we want to have a strictly unital theory, then if we normalize F composed with the identity, we should get back F. Let's try something a bit more complicated. Let's try a unitor lambda F. This is the coherence law. It says the identity composed with F is, is equivalent to F itself. Um, so what do we do? Firstly, we look at this subterm. We can prune that subterm. Look, this is the, this is the term we were considering here. So we know we can prune it to this, we can prune this subterm to the unary composite of F. And we know now that we can reduce uh, the unary composite of F to F itself by a disk reduction. But now this is the definition of the identity on F. So sanity check, we've started with lambda F and we've reduced it to the identity on F. I think that deserves a green tick. I think that's exactly what we would expect in a strictly, say in a, for example, in a strict monoidal category, lambda f is the identity on, on f. That's great. Now, a more complicated example. What about an associator with an identity? Suppose we've got three composable one morphisms where the central one morphism happens to be an identity. Then there isn't really anything to associate. There's just f and g. So intuitively, to my mind, we might expect this to just completely collapse. So indeed, that is what happens, and it's quite nice because it uses all parts of our reduction relations. So what is this associator? We defined the associator earlier. The associator is defined by saying, in this pasting context where I've got three one cells, F, G, and H, there's a, there's a law that says F compose G compose H this way is equivalent to F compose G compose H this way. Great. Now, what can we do with this? Well, first of all, we can prune because we see that we're substituting in an identity for this middle variable G, which is locally maximal. So we rip that one cell out. We're now just left with two cells, F and H, although we rename the H to, to, to G here. Uh, and so, and, and we're, left, we're left with this. Uh, and now we notice that in, instead of composing with G here, of course, G has been ripped out. Uh, we're, now, we're now composing with the identity of Y here. But now this can be reduced. This goes back to what we had here, right? So this is subterm reduction. This reduces to the unary composite of F. Here, this reduces to the unary composite of G. So that's some more subterm pruning. Those unary composites reduce to F and G respectively. So that's subterm reduction using our disk rule. Now we're left with uh, an example of our loop cancellation rule. This is a coherence law that says in this pasting context of two uh, one cells, F composed with G is equal to F composed with G. <laughs> well, of course it is, uh, but that's not a very interesting coherence law. And we can use our loop uh, removal reduction to just replace that with the identity uh, on 
uh, F composed with G. And if we unpack this, it's a different term. So that, okay, which is maybe related to what Emily was asking earlier. So if we take the associator of a one cell, an identity and a third one cell, it normalizes to the identity on the composite of those two non-trivial one cells. Again, I think that deserves a tick. I think that's a reasonable, def uh, I think it's a reasonable uh, normal form for the associator. And again, as another sanity check, in a strict monoidal category, if F and G are objects, then it certainly will be the case that alpha F identity G will be identical to the identity on F composed with G, right? That's one of the mergers, as one of the, the properties of a strict monoidal category. So it seems to make sense uh, in all these cases. Okay, so now a few theorems from our paper. Reduction is terminating and has unique normal forms. So that means given any two terms, we can easily identify whether or not they're related by some sequence of reductions, P reductions, D reductions, and L reductions. <clears throat> so now we can define a type theory cat SU in the following way. We take this basic type theory cat, uh, which remember had no notion of definitional equality, and we give it a notion of definitional equality. We say two terms T and T prime should be treated as equivalent to each other, judgmentally equal, uh, definitionally equal in the type theory, just when T and T prime have the same normal form. So that's a definition of cat SU as a type theory, if you like. And then of course, um, the typing relations, the typing judgments. Sorry, sorry Emily. Quick. Uh, do T and T hmm? prime have to live in the same type? I mean, because it seems like if you're, so for instance, you reduce hmm? the associate or the left unit or, um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's something kind of funny about the, these reductions because mm -hmm. they're changing sort of the boundary of the cell as well as- Absolutely, that's right. That's right. So if, so a beautiful, beautifully simple feature of cat is that terms have unique types. Okay, so any term, it lives in some home set has some boundary and that's its type. Mm -hmm. right? It's not this business of having multiple types, but it's absolutely the case as we've seen with this associator that because um, the, 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 what's the source of this associator? Well, it's F composed with identity composed with G. What's the source of this guy? It's F composed with G. So clearly terms can normalize to other terms. That is, they can be definite. So two terms can be definition equal when they fail to have the same type. And so indeed it will be the case that in CAT SU, uh, terms do not have unique types. And what we do as part of building this type theory CAT SU, we close all of the typing uh, judgments by definitional equality, right? So we declare this to be a congruence for everything, right? So we're not trying to do anything clever, we're trying to do the simplest possible thing. We're trying to say, indeed, that's how we set it up. We just, we just brute force add it as a congruence, but it's still perfectly easy to handle because still types are just pairs of terms. Um, uh, everything has got such a, very, has got a, a simple structure. And because reduction is terminating has unique normal forms, we can decide everything that we need to decide. So given a term and a type, we can decide if that term has that type just by reducing everything. Does that answer your question? I am brushing over a number of technical details and, and beyond a certain point, we're going to get to points where we could have done it one way or the other way. And maybe I can't even remember exactly how we... Sure. How we so, do do that um, certain thing, but these are perfectly reasonable questions which we spent months wrestling with. Exactly. Let me how just we're uh, repeat a little bit of that to make sure I understand. So, in particular, mm -hmm. the the left unit or at F is equal in the sense to the identity at F. Mm -hmm. Yes. Even though those are in cat TT without the subscripts, those live in different types, but they're equal as terms in cat S. Indeed, and indeed, those two types, the types that T, so the type that T has in cat, mm -hmm. and the type that T prime has in cat. They both exist as CAT SU types and they are definitionally equal as CAT SU types. Otherwise something crazy would be going on. Right, and the, there's probably something that you could prove like if you're getting that sort of same normal form then the horizontal source and the, of the two terms have to have the same normal form as well or something. Exactly like that. right, exactly right. Yep. Um, okay. Eric and David, if you're here, do you maybe want to pitch in, did I? Uh, yeah, it's just it's just that in the in the SU theory, the types also reduce because they're made of terms. 
And so they, so terms will still have unique types, but now up to types being quotiented by the normalization. Thanks. That's what you mean by unique. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I said earlier, cat is this sort of unusual sort of theory. It doesn't compute anything. Terms don't normalize, they just sit there. But in cat SU, terms do compute and they compute to their strictly uniform normal form. It's sort of a nice conceptual feature of the type theory. Now there's an obvious projection functor. Um, so I, I've skipped something out here. So we can build a cat, we can think of cat as a category where objects are contexts, morphisms are substitutions. And we can think of cat SU also as a category where objects are contexts, morphisms are substitutions. But obviously then in cat SU, we're taking those substitutions up to definitional equality. So there's an obvious uh, functor between these categories, namely the identity, because anything that's valid in cat is also valid in cat SU. Because the only difference between the theory is that cat SU has got a broader notion of definitional equality than cat. So anything that's valid in cat must be valid in cat SU. So this is really the identity uh, functor on, on syntax. As, as a category, it certainly fails to be faithful. And then we get a very easy definition of a strictly unital infinity category. It's just an infinity category that is a globular sum preserving pre-sheaf. So I'm, I'm, I'm missing something here. We should just be referring to the subcategory just comprising the pasting contexts, excuse me. Um, so we get a very easy definition of a strictly unital infinity category. It's an infinity category, a pre-sheaf on cat op sub PS, uh, which remember had to preserve globular sums. And then we ask for it to have the property that it factorizes through this projection functor, which identifies syntactic elements here whenever they have the same strictly unital structure. So again, we can do a sanity check on this. Given an infinity category, it should be a property whether or not it's strictly unital. It shouldn't be structure. And that's what we're seeing. Now, uh, it's my pleasure to mention that Batanin, Jasinski, and Weber have a really beautiful paper on strictly unit infinity categories. I think it's the only other paper on strictly unit infinity categories uh, 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 in, in this, in, in, in the, at least from this contractible perspective. They approach things very differently. It's, it's hard to make very precise uh, correspondences between our results. It's clear they have some sort of analog of this pruning relation and this disk relation but they don't have anything that, that seems to correspond to this loop reduction relation. So it seems to us that our theory relates more terms than the batanin jasinski weber theory. Uh, and in particular, it seems to us say that, you see here, we use the loop, the loop reduction here to show that this, this associator reduced to this identity. Uh, uh, batanin jasinski uh, weber's uh, approach is somehow less constructive. You can't really do these computations as directly, but I would guess that in their theory, this term is not equivalent to this term. These terms are not identified. So it seems to me, it seems to me that our theory is stronger than theirs in a way that seems, seems good. Of course, you don't want to be too strong or you could be trivial. We know that our theory is not trivial, um, but it's, it's my pleasure to point out that relation to that, that very nice previous work that's gone before. And now this is the work in progress that I think if I hadn't had a baby born six weeks ago, we might have, have this now. Anyway, we conjecture that every infinity category is weakly equivalent to a strictly unital infinity category. And that's the last big chunk of this project that we're trying to get finished off. It's not in place yet. Who knows? Maybe, maybe it goes wrong. Okay, so now I'm on to, on to some big exciting examples just before I finish up. So I'm going to talk about two examples that I really love, the Ekman-Hilton homotopy and the Solepsis homotopy. So the Ekman-Hilton homotopy, everybody here is going to be very familiar with, unless they've turned up to the wrong Zoom call. Okay, so the Ekman-Hilton homotopy lives in this context gamma, which I've drawn up here in the corner. So we have a zero cell X. We have a two cell S from the identity on X to the identity on X. And we have a two cell T from the identity on X to the identity on X. So that's the context in which we're, uh, living, you could you could build you could see these uh, elements of some identity type and must be type theory, right? I mean, you could work with with that, or you could consider some two groupoid with elements like this, or some two categories. All sorts of ways you could interpret uh, what I'm saying. And in this context, we expect there to exist something we can call the Ekman-Hilton three cell, whose source is S composed with T, and whose target is T composed with S. 
Okay, so this is something we're all familiar with. It's there in the homotopy type theory book. It's a really important canonical example. So it says that composition, when you when when you deloop in this way, composition becomes commutative. Now we can build this in Cat SU in a very nice way as, as, as a single interchange of term as follows. So I, I haven't given as much detail as I, as I possibly could. The point is that this whole term on the left, what's this? This is T horizontally composed with the identity on the identity on X, all vertically composed with the identity on X, sorry, the identity on the identity on X uh, horizontally composed with S. So this is a fourfold composite. And this is a weak infinity category. So we have an interchanger. Um, and that says that this is canonically equivalent to performing these composites in a different way. Now, wait a minute, why I'm claiming that this is the Ekman-Hilton cell, but its source is this complicated thing. But, but the source should be S composed with T, right? But in Cat SU, the point is that this guy is definitionally equal to this simple composite. So that's why we're already finished, actually. So let's see why that is. Well, we can take this here, we're taking S, and we're composing it with an identity. So we can just prune this whole guy away on the left. Poof, it's disappeared, now we've just got S. Here we're taking T, and we're composing it with the identity of an identity on the right. So we can prune that whole thing away, poof, it's gone. Now we've just got, and of course this is a reduction, so this term is definitionally equal to this term, as far as CASSU is concerned, they're the same term. So now what have we got? This is, the, this, is, this is a sort of heuristic notation, but the idea is that this isn't in fact S, this is now a unary composite of S. This is a unary composite of T. So we can remove those unary composites and just get S and T. So now we see that the target of U is in fact definitionally equal to T composed with S as required. And of course the same on the other side. So the source of U is definitionally equal to S composed with T. The target of U is definitionally equal to T composed with S. So this is it, this single thing. Uh, this is the Ekman-Hilton three cell in Cat SU. Now, we can also construct this in the type theory cat. Now, the, in the type theory cat, we can certainly build this, this uh, interchanger, but this guy is certainly not in cat definitionally to equal to this guy. Indeed, cat has no notion of definitional equality. So in cat, we can build this guy, but we are very far from done. We've got to build a very complex series of uh, coherences that exhibit the fact that this guy is equivalent to this guy. And in fact, notice how difficult that's going to be. When I take this, when I take this guy here and I prune away this identity guy on the left, I get this. But this thing I've pruned, again, going back to the point Emily noticed earlier, this thing I've pruned doesn't even have the same type as this original guy. Because look, the type of this original guy here is id compose id to id compose id, but the type of this guy is id to id. So this guy isn't even equivalent to this guy because to be equivalent, you have to, you have to be parallel at, at least in a globular setting for higher category theory. So you have to do a huge amount of work to eliminate this, but you can do it. So, you know, you could spend maybe a day playing with CAD. I'm not saying it's enormously difficult, right? We're all clever people, touch wood. And so we can do it. And this is the syntax tree that you get. So I can't give, the, the, I can't give it because uh, it's too big to give, but we can visualize it in some sense, the syntax tree of the term. So this is Ekman Hilton in CAT. It's got 1,224 vertices. It has this funny structure because it's like a repeated binary composite. Okay. Um, now, okay, well, what about the syntax tree of this guy in CAT SU? Right? It's tiny, it's got 60 vertices. It's just this central thing. If you spill this out, there are only 60 things going on. So 20 times smaller. I've drawn it at the same scale to, for maximum visual impact, right? Let's draw it a little bit larger. Um, so this is the perfect illustration of why we think these techniques are potentially important in the world of, uh, if you're in the game of, of trying to use type theory to work with weak higher categories, um, the unit structure of higher dimensional terms can very quickly become 
almost unfathomably complex. Okay. And this is an this is this is an illustration. So working with the proof assistant cat SU, you know, if you have the right intuition, you could build this, you know, in a in a few minutes. You could build this. However, even if you start with exactly the right intuition, it's it's a it's a half a day, a day's work to formalize Ekman Hilton in CAT. Maybe broadly similar to, to I mean, if you wanted to, to do it with the J rule or something. I mean, that, that's a different, right? That, that, that's a different uh, setup, of course. So now let's let's go up a gear. Now let's think about the solepsis. This might be less well known. The solepsis is uh, Ekman Hilton on steroids. Okay, so let's look at the signature. So Ekman Hilton, we had a zero cell. And then we had S and T endomorphisms of the identity on that zero cell. Okay. For the solepsis, it's a similar sort of signature. We've just got a single zero cell, but now S and T are endomorphisms of the identity on the identity on that zero cell. So we've we've de-looped one, one extra dimension. Everything's just got more space around it. And in this context gamma, the solepsis five cell, if we can build it, it, it's, the, it's the thing that would have the following type. This is the following. If we take Ekman-Hilton for S and T, actually Ekman-Hilton now as a, as a four cell. So this, isn't, this, is, this EH isn't exactly this S because, every, because S and T are now four cells, not three cells. But, but apart from that, it's, it's the obvious analog of Ekman-Hilton. So this is a four cell that says, take S, braid it around T. And now this says, take T and braid it around S. So this is like a double braid. So S has been braided around T uh, uh, and, and back around again. Now we could certainly form that here. We could take EH ST and compose that with EH inverse T comma S. So that would be taking S and T, braiding them around each other, braiding them around each other again. But this would not be equivalent to the identity in any sense. But in this uh, higher, more suspended scenario, in fact, this double braid will be equal to the identity, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's homotopically pretty clear, right? You've got an extra dimension of, of freedom. So this double braid, right? It looks like, like it might be knotted, right? These guys are, are not a, a braided around each other, but you can just move away in, in the extra dimension and just un separate the strands and there's no knot at all, right? So this is one of, so the Ekman-Hilton move is like the first phenomenon that you see in homotopy groups of spheres. And the solepsis is like the second phenomenon that you see that causes some of these homotopy groups to be finite. So geometrically, the double braid is the identity when you've got enough space. Now, we can construct it in cat -SU. Its syntax tree has 2,713 vertices. It's too complicated. It took us about a day to do this. Um, it's not particularly insightful, maybe looking at the looking at the syntax, uh, looking at the syntax tree. Um, <clears throat> we cannot yet construct the solepsis in CAT. If we finish this work in progress, right, we, we have this conjecture that every infinity category is equivalent to a strictly unital infinity category, then we could leverage that engine to feed in our CAT SU proof and it would spit us back out a cat proof. I would estimate that the proof of the solepsis uh, in cat, in this basic type theory, we have about 100,000 vertices. Okay. I don't have much, uh, I, I can't give you much hard evidence for that. It's going to be really, it's going to be really big. It was already such a headache to just take Ekman Hilton and then, and then tell Cat how to insert the weak structure that correctly manipulated these units. Things are unimaginably worse for the solepsis. So, to my knowledge, nobody has ever formalized the solepsis. No one's ever exhibited the solepsis in the theory of contractible infinity categories. To my knowledge, nobody has ever exhibited the solepsis in any pure theory of path types. For example, purely in just using J, the, we should just be able to write down the solepsis. I don't think anyone's ever 
uh, done that, you, you could, because homotopy type theory is of course a structured type theory and it's, it's, it's much more powerful, you could maybe build richer things that compute to the solepsis or something like that. I, I don't know if anyone's done that either, but certainly it would be a very difficult thing to do to just write down using J some term that deserves to be called the solepsis um, five cell. And indeed we can't do it by hand in cat, but we can do it in cat SU. So this could be the first time that in some type theory, the, the, some type theory for high category theory, the solepsis has been explicitly written out. Okay, so this is my last slide. My timing's worked well for once. So what's the takeaway? Path types are not contractible. I think everybody would agree with that. So if we have F and G, right? It's on a pair of two paths in, in, in the same type. Well, the target of F might be Y, the source of G might be Y prime, and these paths might not be composable. That's tough. If you want to compose them, you maybe have to find a third path that goes from Y to Y prime. If you don't have such a path available, well, you can't compose F and G. But path types can, our work shows, be carved into contractible pieces, right? By trivializing the unit structure. So even Y and even though Y and Y type, y, even though Y and Y prime might not be the same point in this path space, it might be that up to unit structure, Y and Y prime are, say, definitionally equal. In which case, it seems uh, reasonable, and we've shown in, in our work that indeed this is possible type theoretically, to design your type system so that it knows about that and can allow you to compose F and G just when Y and Y prime uh, live in one of these little contractible areas. And then what we believe this means, this is the work in progress part of our story, is that what you could then do if you wanted is say to this type theory, okay, great, but now give me back the path that links Y to Y prime and give me the full composite if, if you wanted to do that. So we're talking about an engine that of course doesn't trivialize path types, but chops path types in, up into, into little contractible pieces, hence potentially making them much easier to work with for certain purposes. So the obvious question is, can we have these advantages also for identity types as we use them on the Mosby type theory? Now, the way that path types are set up uh, traditionally, um, you can have a little bit of strict unital behavior. For example, you can set up composition so that REFL is, so that composing with REFL is strictly unital on the left, say, but not on the right. Um, so you can certainly have a little bit of this, but I think it's clear that it doesn't go as far as we're talking about in this project, right? Where we managed to, I hope in, you'll agree in something of a convincing way, really trivialize the entire unit structure in a way that causes proofs of even uh, complicated phenomena like the Ekman-Hilton argument to be almost immediate. You can just write them down in, in just a few lines. Now, why should we want to do this, right? Nobody's saying that it, that you know these higher coherences are not important, right? If y is different to y prime, of course that matters. Of course it matters whether or not we can find a path that goes between them. Um, that's what proof relevance means. But shouldn't isn't it reasonable to ask our proof assistants to do as much as is conceivably possible to help us? So if we can supply two terms, which we know are in one of these contractible regions, it would be great if we could ask our proof assistant to either ignore the fact that they're distinct, right? And treat them as if they're equivalent to each other. Or maybe we could ask it. Wikipedia, 20% of the world's unfrozen fresh water is in Russia's Lake Baikal. It is also considered the world's this? deepest, clearest and oldest lake. Well, there we go. Thank you very much, Amazon. I mean, thank you very much, Google. Okay, so the climax of my talk completely ruined there, uh, and I've lost my train of thought, but I think, I think you see what I'm suggesting. Um, uh, so Eric, Eric, Eric made a really nice point to me the other day. He says, you know, there are people who get really interested, at least potentially, for example, someone like Kevin Buzzard, to pick unfairly on Kevin Buzzard, he's obviously richly engaged with the formal proof community, 
but then he takes some of the ideas of multiple type theory and says, nah, I'm not really a proof relevant kind of guy. I prefer lean. It's simpler. Everything just truncates. Maybe what these people are, 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 maybe what annoys these people isn't that they have to handle proof relevance, but they have to handle proof relevance even in scenarios where it should be obvious, at least to their classical mathematician intuition, what, 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 what should be filled in or how this higher structure should be behaving. So maybe what, what, what we're talking about in here could, could bridge some of that gap between what we do as higher dimensional type theorists where we, we're happy, we work happily and freely with this higher dimensional coherence data, we think it's great, and maybe working mathematicians who just want to prove, say, x equals y, and they want to be able to do this as easily as possible, of course, without throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So then my third question is, of course, homotopy type theory contains a lot more than path types. It's a very richly structured logic. What we're saying here is that we can take a non-contractible type and chop it up into contractible pieces, and that can be enormously useful. But that's an idea that could apply far beyond path types, could apply to any sort of type that we work with, right? We could say, can we take our, 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 our product types, subtypes, whatever we're working with, and recognize that they're not contractible, but chop them into contractible pieces in such a way that our proof assistant can then help us with a lot more uh, of, can handle more coherence issues than is traditionally the case. Okay, it's the end of my talk. Thanks a lot. Great, thanks for that wonderful talk, Jamie. And now we'll do our traditional silent visual applause. Thank you, it's very, very kind. <laughs> All right, and are there any questions? Uh, yeah, I, I've got a question. Hi, Andy. Hi, um, actually this is a question about the solepsis. Um, uh -huh. So if you ask me to write down the Ekman Hilton term um, in in Martin mm -hmm. type theory, uh -huh. um, I can I can imagine that just doing it with the eliminator for for equality types would be pretty tedious, but you could do it. But of mm -hmm. course, it's completely trivial to do it if you have dependent pattern matching, and I imagine the same is true for the solepsis. Now we have we have implementations of dependent pattern matching you know, they compile into eliminators. So presumably one way of getting the uh, the term for the solepsis is to write the trivial thing with dependent pattern matching and, and then uh, compile it into, uh, you know, in, into eliminators using one of the algorithms. Uh, yeah, I believe that Lean, for example, implements dependent pattern matching by, by, by elaboration into eliminators. Uh, using uh, an algorithm that's probably due to Conor McBride, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, so in principle, there's a way of generating your your horrific mm -hmm. term automatically. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. So, I think it's entirely reasonable to say, well, this is all well and good. You know, this this would be very difficult to formalize by hand. Um, but why would anyone do that? We have more powerful techniques available. That's a that's a perfectly fair point. Uh, this is, I mean, uh, uh, this is work that lives in a type theory for infinity categories with no structure, well, other than the structure of being an infinity category, which is quite a lot of structure, right? So this is in, in, a, in a simpler setup. Um, but to me, it's such a basic observation that, I mean, the way I phrase it on this final slide, uh, you know, path types are not contractible, but they can carve, be carved into contractible pieces now I'm, I'm, I'm not a homotopy type theorist, I collaborate with homotopy type theorists. So I don't quite know what you could use this for, but I would sort of be surprised if this wasn't <laughs> useful in some scenarios. Anyway, maybe 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 Eric or David, you want to come in or maybe someone else. Uh, this would be a great thing to, to, to discuss. I'm, I'm not sure I, I have uh, a great, I'll, a great. I'll jump in. To, I... Mm -hmm. I've dealt with dealing with path algebra lots of times, and I certainly think it would be really valuable if somehow we had more strict definitional equalities or could pretend we had them in some automatic mm -hmm. way. Uh, I, I think that would really get rid of a lot of the mm -hmm. grunt work that we have to deal with. So, 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 so could, is somebody, maybe somebody present, capable in, in, in 
I mean, would it be within the powers of somebody here to do this for the solepsis? So construct the solepsis, you know, using some high power technology and then just unfold that into some profoundly large sequence of basic identity eliminators. Or is there actually some fundamental, because I've never seen that. And I have indeed, I think what so I sent an email to the homotopy type theory list saying, hey, has anyone done this? Maybe it's just a boring thing to do, which I could accept, but I would like to see it. So is it agreed? Does anyone think that maybe that's not actually straightforwardly possible? I think it's worth trying. I certainly made a note when you brought it up to, to play with it myself. Um, but one thing that might help is I, I actually discovered a, a two line proof of Ekman Hilton in hot um, that mm -hmm. I need to, uh, to try to push to the hot repo. But uh, there's, a, there's sort of a clever way to do it that doesn't use the interchange law as you wrote it, but uses a, one that's mm -hmm. got some extra identities in it um, that make it look worse, but make it actually mm -hmm. compose with itself in a really nice way so you get this mm. work proof. I see. Um, so that, that could that's then nice. help with the solepsis. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, um, so, yeah. so I uh, also want to comment on any, any of so, this? So, so I, I could pick on Mike Shulman because I can see you're there. In one of your, I mean, obviously, when I was a PhD student, I spent my life reading the N Category Cafe instead of doing any work. And there's some, like, the, almost like the first post you ever made on the cafe on homotopy type theory. You talk about the solepsis. You say, you know, this is a, hom this is a homotopical phenomenon that we could express in, in, in type theory. Uh, now, maybe when you said that, you didn't mean using eliminators in the most like basic way conceivable. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, ever since I, I, I read I, that, yeah. Uh, I, I, I certainly didn't mean that I'd ever done it. Uh, I, I, I'm sure that one could do it. Uh, no, you were taught, you were, Sue said uh, you were writing hypothetically at, yeah. at that time, absolutely. Yeah. So, so can somebody here say, Yes, it's definitely possible to uh, build the solepsis. Uh, you know, using how, use it, 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 it's definitely possible to do something that spits out uh, the solepsis in in base just built out of basic uh, path manipulations. Nobody seems absolutely convinced that that's definitely a straightforward thing to do. What about you, Andy? Oh yeah, I mean, I'm convinced that it's that it's right. yeah doable. Yeah, I mean, I don't have in my hands, as it were, uh, in, uh, sure. an implementation that I could just run and give you the thing. Sure. Yeah. I, I was, I was, Andy. I, I didn't quite understand. Are you talking about the dependent pattern matching that that uh, without K? Yes. Yes. So, isn't it possible to give a relatively straightforward definition of the solipsis using that or not? It's not obvious to me how. Ah, oh, okay, right. Yeah, right. I, I kind of, I kind of agree. Like Ekman Hilton, you can't just match away all the arguments because some of their endpoints are fixed to be identities. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. so you so have the same to, is true. Have to same is true for a the bunch of things yes. where you can match, and it's not so obvious how to do that. So it's not yeah. completely trivial. Okay. <clears throat> in that case, in that case, I don't, as it were, have a, a magic way of producing. It. Okay. So that's interesting. I, mean, I, guess that in principle, I guess in principle, something like this should follow from uh, Guillaume's proof of, of calculating a particular homotopy group of sphere, uh, that there is this relation. Uh, uh, but I don't know, in order to get it to reduce to some actual identity type, we would definitely need to be in something like cubicle. And I guess they've had problems with that. So, so I don't know if we have an alternate construction of it somehow. That's really um, interesting. I hadn't occurred to me that solipsis is 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 really the the proof of of the Brunery number, isn't it? Yeah, it's the mm -hmm. proof that that of, it's z mod two and not z. Yeah. So, so in principle, we kind of have an argument for it, but to actually run it to get a term uh, has been problematic, as far as I know. I don't think anybody's managed to to actually get it to to spit out the the right number, have they? Right. So it's not totally clear. I mean, it's I yeah. think it's in principle possible, but yeah. practically still out of reach. So, so, of course, if you did do that, I think we all agree that you would get a term which would be in enormous. 
Okay, well, we, you know, our computers have got lots of memory, so that's okay. Um, so then the point is, if we were able to work definitionally with identity types in homotopy type theory in such a way that, of course, we don't contract the identity types, but we, contract, we, we carve them into contractible pieces, um, it potentially would drastically reduce the size of that, of, that, uh, of that term. But the point is, we can't do this at the moment because the way that we, the way that we work with our path types uh, in, in this type theory cat uh, is, is comes from the perspective of the theory of contractible infinity categories, it's type theoretical, but the terms, have, I mean, the way we compose, way we build composites, basically these pacing diagrams is very, very different to how you build, how you make composites and uh, reason uh, and apply coherences and so on in, 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 in Martin Loeff theory. So, so, I mean, this step is not at all obvious to me, right? How you could, even if you, I mean, we sort of been talking about, would you want to, what would there be an advantage? But a separate question is how could you do it, right? If you wanted to be able to work definitionally with Martin Loeff identity types up to some unit trivialization. It's a question of how you could do that. Feels to me that the, the, the way composition works here it's more geometrical in the sense it's based on this notion of pasting diagram, and then you can manipulate that as a combinatorial entity. And that's, of course, how this our project of ours works. And I don't quite see what would replace that on the, on the identity type side. So that's why there's a question mark. Uh, another thing you could ask about is, is associators, by the way, and having We've just been thinking about trivializing units, but you could also ask if you could trivialize associators, and it's a reasonable conjecture that every infinity category is equivalent to a strictly unit or strictly associative infinity category. And that having gone through, I mean, we wanted to make our job as easy as possible and just focus on the units, but having basically done all of this, you know, being maybe, maybe having a quick whiskey first to give me courage, the associators don't seem much harder. It's just the same. The same approach basically works. Of course, you need to change your reduction relation. It's a relatively obvious thing you would choose. Um, so we could imagine being in a world where not only are identities trivialized, but also associators are trivialized. So that's perhaps uh, that, that's a certain degree more powerful. I mean, maybe I misunderstand you, but wouldn't that imply some sort of equivalence between three categories and tri categories that we know to be false. Um, so, so in, in, I would say that tri categories uh, have got three sort of sources, three, three uh, sources for their weak structure, units, associators, and interchanges. And so I wouldn't be trivializing the, the, the grades. All right, so exactly these, these, these interchanger moves uh, would, would, would be the thing that, that aren't trivialized. <clears throat> so Jamie, I, I got the impression mm -hmm. that you've, that this is implemented. Is that, is that correct? Like you have a proof assistant that you can work with? Yeah, Eric, do you want to say something about that? Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, I don't know if the link is on there, but there, there's- the Sorry, no, that, no, sorry about that. Uh, yeah, there's an implementation and it has, um, it has the uh, the raw version and then a little flag for the strict unit version. And if you turn on the strict unit version, um, a bunch more things type check, obviously, because uh, because things start reducing and type checking is modular reduction. So so the solipsis is uh, uh, is done. Maybe I can maybe I can paste a link in the chat here and you can you can check out the term. Hold on just a second. Uh, so for example, uh, to everyone, I'll paste in the chat, there's the link to the implementation and there's a couple examples. Here's a link directly to the solipsis so you can check it out if you like. There you go. Uh, so yeah, it is, it is implemented. Anyone else have a question? So I also wanted to ask, you mentioned the relation to these contractible weak infinity categories. Mm -hmm. um, what about relations to things like 
you know, bias dual and apotopic infinity categories or anything else? Is, is anything known about that? I don't think anyone's known, but Eric would be the person to ask. Yeah, I don't think we have any direct, uh, I don't think we've been able to use methods like this to have uh, broaden the range of things we know to be equivalent um, other than working inside this, these various presentations of these uh, globular contractible versions. So uh, it's not immediately clear how to use this kind of type theoretic stuff to, um, to have something more sophisticated. So, so, so if you, I mean, if you go back and look at these, these four people's work, Grothendieck, Monsignotis, Botanin, Leinster, and then CAT, there's a type theory uh, from uh, Eric and Samuel. Those are five different theories of infinity categories, each of which builds impressively on the one before, but nonetheless, they're all in some sense based, it's the same idea, right? I mean, I think we can all go back to Grothendieck and say, thanks for starting the chain. <laughs> Okay, in a way that, in a way that, uh, you know, the theory of apotopic infinity categories is just not part of this family. Right. What's, what's the meaning of the word contractible in that context? It, it seems a bit misleading to me. So it, it so the, the word contractible, I wonder where that first came in. Certainly it comes in, in, in the sort of most modern treatment of Tom Leinster, where he says um, a, a, <clears throat> Uh, he defines infinity category uh, to be an algebra for the initial contractible globular operad. So there's a framework of globular operads that you can use to reason abstractly about all sorts of theories of globular infinity categories. And then you can say, okay, but what's the theory that, you know, Grothendieck had? How do we privilege one of these, uh, how do we privilege one of these, what, what, some family of these operads? And the idea that's, that can be traced through all of this work is that we want our operands to be equipped with a contraction. And that basically says, I mean, the devil is in the detail and the difference between these theories is of course, and how these things are encoded, I don't want to trivialize it, but it's basically the same idea as is exhibited here. If you've got some term living over a pasting diagram and you've got some other term living over, live over the same pasting diagram, then well, pasting diagrams are contractible geometrically. So U and V, there has to be a contraction, a filler that fills between U and V. So a contractible infinity, a contractible, uh, <coughs> the, the con contractible globular operad is a globular, a globular operad is contractible when it has fillers um, of exactly this sort. The initial contractible globular op operad has the minimally. And so then a good definition of contractible infinity category in this Grothendieck spirit is an algebra for the initial contractible globular operad. That's how. That's how Tom Leinster would develop the theory in his beautiful book. But as I say, you've got to get to the end of his book to understand what all those words mean. And what to me is so attractive about Eric and Samuel's type theory is that you can read the whole definition of the type theory in half a page. It's not particularly complicated as type theories go. It doesn't even have, I mean, that's, that's I'm saying that that's a compliment, right? Um, but now, but, but, but now you, you somehow already then understand what contractible infinity categories are because now terms in this type theory are just the same as, um, at least in the free case, they're just the same as morphisms in a, um, a contractible infinity category in, in the spirit, in the sense of Leinster. And indeed we can give this very simple definition of infinity category for which you don't need any of the technology of global operads, globular extensions. So, you know, if, so you could say, well, where's the global, global operad gone? Of course, the global operad is still around, but you, you could prove it as a theorem, right? That these structures, the cat PS and these functors and so on can be equipped with the structure of the global operad. So it's the other way around. Tom Leinster, you know, you have to put it in because that's the infrastructure you're using to build your theory of infinity categories here. It, instead, it, it, it comes out. So in that sense, uh, this is more uh, elementary, at least to my uh, mind. And as mathematicians, we want things to be as elementary as possible, right? All By the theory. way, I think we should mention that, that uh, the, the style of presentation really, really originates with Guillaume. And, uh, and we, we built on a lot of- Brunier, thank you. I missed that name out. Thank you. So Guillaume Brunier really goes in. 
he goes in here after Leinster and before Minster, Finster and Mimram. Thank you. That was also a, a type theoretical recasting. Thanks for reminding me about that. I'll, I'll, I'll make that edit before I give you these slides if you want to put them on the web. Okay, last call for questions or comments. Uh, okay, since you have this slide uh, there right now, maybe I can ask, um, is there a variation of this definition which is based on type value or on, on space valued pre-sheaves instead of set valued pre-sheaves? I don't know. Does anybody else want to chime in? I'm not sure what you might mean by space valued. Oh, you mean you mean the value in well, top or? Yeah, right. Yeah, I see. I mean, more a question for Eric since. Uh, well, that would give you a perfectly good definition of topological infinity category. I don't know. Right. I mean, you would probably yeah. want to say like the, 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 it preserved. No, but the, the globular, I'm not sure. I've never seen a definition along those lines. Um, okay. Uh, Thanks. If, 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 if you did that, I mean, you would certainly have, uh, you know, a topological space of oblet objects, topological space of one morphisms. Your composition operations would be continuous. If that's what you yeah. want, then you, you could do it like that. It would also be a bit surprising what this would axiomatize because somehow the structure is already supposed to be an infinity infinity category. So it would be like an infinity infinity category, which should already know everything about homotopy theory. And then you would build in another layer of homotopy theory, which would sort of, I don't quite see where, like what that would encapsulate somehow. Right. You would expect also a kind of completeness axiom, but it's not clear how to get that from just the right. Uh, just the type theory as presented. So, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure about that. It's like the completeness axioms would almost kill the whole space aspect because you've already encoded everything you want to encode. So you could say, and everything would sort of a space like you, you kill away. Um, mm. Or you get okay. some, some new notion of like infinity, infinity category internal to spaces. I guess that's something one could think about. And I, but I don't. Yeah, know. yeah. I mean, I guess this is what I meant. Yeah. Okay, so you're saying it's not obvious that it could work or could be possible. Any, anything's possible, but. <laughs> okay, okay, thanks. I haven't seen a definition along these lines yet, but uh, it, it could be possible, yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, well, I think we're basically out of time. That was a great discussion. Um, so we will uh, pause right now to thank Jamie again for that great talk. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Really appreciate it. Nice so that question. was the last talk of our third year of Hottest. Uh, and um, we're the ones who taught you how to use Zoom before you, need to, before you knew how much you would need it. Um, our next talk will be January 28th. Thierry Cocon will be giving that talk. And uh, we have a slate of talks coming up after that as well. So see you January 28th.